Um, I, I want to start by um, thanking the organisers, partly for um, inviting me, but also for um, organising an event like this. It's a very unusual conflict-related event to have um, such a wide range of uh, contrib contributors spanning social sciences and humanities. And it's um, someone whose ba background is as chaotic as mine. It's nice. <laughs> um, that range of things. Um, just to position myself um, a little bit, um, as Lisa said, I've, I've worked as a, as a human rights practitioner, um, as well as in, in academia. My, uh, my academic background is that I did an undergraduate degree in uh, geography, a master's degree in area studies, a PhD in cultural studies, and I'm now from politics. <laughs> um, so I'm genuinely um, confused. Um, but, but it explains a little bit why this kind of uh, workshop is very appealing. Um, I'm going to be talking, uh, I suppose, really more directly to, to field work in conflict and post-conflict uh, settings. Most of my experience has been in, in South Africa, but also experience in, in other parts of, of Africa, Rwanda, and, um, and elsewhere. Um, and I suppose, finally, by way of context, this work draws on two streams of work that we've been doing at our centre. One from time, some time ago, which was entitled Responsibility to the Story, which brought together um, people as diverse as museum curators, um, through to human rights practitioners, people who work with narratives of others, to discuss really ethical and methodological questions about the responsibilities that we have as practitioners and academics um, to those whose stories we work with. Um, so this relates directly to that stream of work. It also relates perhaps slightly more tangentially to um, some more recent work we've been doing um, funded by the AHRC on translating freedom, which has looked at um, how freedom is understood in local contexts um, in post-conflict settings. And we've looked at four case studies there, South Africa, Rwanda, Egypt, um, and, and Northern Ireland. Um, so that's a little bit about my background and where I'm coming from. Um, I want to start by looking at the work, or saying a little bit about the work of Gakko Shun, talking about reflective practice, because it's had, I guess, informed a lot of the teaching that we do and I suppose the way in which I think about this problem. Um, so has essentially argued that a lot of the most important areas of professional practice, and I would include research methods and ethics in this, are either poorly taught in um, formal education environments or training environments or are quite difficult to teach. That there is a gap between the classroom and the field, between generalised rules and the specific case. Um, and as a result, as, as practitioners and professionals, we tend to go out into the world expecting the world to adapt to what we know, as opposed to having the skills to adapt what we know to the world as we find it. Um, and his most telling encapsulation of this text is when he talks about the high ground and the swamp. Um, that in training and teaching, we tend to be presented with very manageable problems that have technical um, and or theoretical solutions, whereas the realities that we find when we go out and into the field or to professional lives are much more messy. Another point to make, which I think is really useful, is, is to encourage us as academics and as researchers to be conscious of our backgrounds and the way it frames the ways in which we see the world. Um, all of us have been shaped by our various disciplinary backgrounds to name and frame the world in particular ways. There are certain things that we will notice and certain things that we won't, um, that there will be problems we identify which will suggest solutions which are linked to those, those backgrounds. So, as an example, as a, as a person immersed in human rights, we look for victims violators and remedies, usually legal remedies. Um, now that, that prism on seeing the world ha it has, the, has the advantage of great clarity and simplicity, but it has all the disadvantages of great clarity and simplicity as well. It airbrushes out <coughs> subjectivities, context, etc., etc. And for me, it has become increasingly conscious, uh, important to be conscious that there are advantages and disadvantages to seeing the world in that way, but there are times when I need to draw on other fields and disciplines to see the world differently, to, to be more effective. Having said 
that could, I've made that criticism of human rights. I don't know of any discipline or field that doesn't also have its blinkers um, and its partialities, I guess, in terms of how it names and shapes the world. So, and for me, this is an ethical question. It is that we, we must be conscious of um, those influences and how they inform the way in which we see the world. So these two things combine to make it quite <coughs> difficult to prepare for, to anticipate what what Schoen calls the uh, intermediate zones of practice. A lot of practical work and field research is very much like this is about uncertainty, uniqueness, value conflict. And actually preparing people for that, training people to uh, to anticipate that and be effective when those kinds of circumstances arise is very difficult. Ultimately it's it's a combination of, if you like, toolkits or rules, ethical and other kinds of rules, and what Schoen calls artistry. Field work is ultimately a craft, um, which is partly why it's very difficult in its totality to teach. Um, some of the skills you need are instinctive skills, kind of learning to ride a bike type skills, and other are more reflective uh, skills, reflection and action, which is what Schoen calls um, artistry. Um, we take a group of our master's students each year to South Africa about eight to ten weeks into their master's course and immerse them in field work where they have to do projects with local NGOs. It is both the most terrifying and I think the most rewarding experience of their entire master's program. Um, and what's most rewarding from the staff side of um, defense, if you like, is, is where you see students making, um, well, doing both of the things which I've just mentioned, partly instinctively making the right kind of decisions, but also we, we require that they keep a reflective diary as part of their assessment, but also reflecting on the experience um, and how they might do things differently. And many of the students do that incredibly effectively. Um, an example would be in our most recent trip, um, one of the groups of students was encouraged to talk to a woman who had suffered very severe violence at the hands of the police uh, in a place called Kailiche, just outside Cape Town. Um, was obviously very traumatized by this in a public place where she just told her story in a public forum, actually the bus rank. It was a, um, um, a way of raising um, awareness around police, police violence and brutality and breakdown of law and order in the um, She just told the story very emotionally publicly and an NGO staff member who lived in Kailiche encouraged our students to go and interview this woman. And they very quickly became aware that um, she agreed to do the interview kind of nominally, but was deeply traumatized and really didn't want to, 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 didn't want to do the interview. Um, she was doing the interview because she knew the NGO staff member and she wanted to please that person and possibly the, uh, the students as well. And so was going through with it despite um, fairly clearly not wanting to do the interview. And, one of the things which was fantastic was the way in which the students, this is not something we prepared them for in any kind of rule-based way, um, other than providing a set of basic principles, I suppose, to refer to. Um, we were able to identify that this was wrong, but more impressively still, we were able to extract themselves from that situation in a way that preserved the dignity of both of the parties, both the NGO staff member and the person they were into. Um, it was really deeply impressive, and it was an example of instinctive ethics, if you like, um, and the craft of, of the world. Um, what I, in my abstract, have undertaken to cover are these three issues, the relationship between the interviewer, interviewer and community, um, negotiating and shifting patterns of violence and conflict, and control and ownership of testimony research in the media age. Coming to prepare this, I realize this is a somewhat ambitious agenda to cover in 30 minutes. So um, I'm probably going to focus most on the first point um, and gradually focus less as we go through. We'll give less time to each topic. Um, some of what I'm going to cover in this last uh, section has been covered already, so I can be relatively brief. Um, so, one of the basic principles that govern research relationships. These are, I guess, a set that I've gleaned from a range of different sources and experiences. The first set of principles relate to harm, protection, and justice. 
Um, and I guess a continuum here between at the one end the requirement that researchers do no harm um, to at the other end the question about is there an obligation to do good is that I think Sasha pointed out this uh, difficult issue um, in the kind of research that many of us do um, is there a requirement to intervene, to act um, to inform policy, to, to invoke change in, in some kind of way and if so kind of requirement is it? How, how should we respond to that, uh, um, to the requirement if it exists? Um, the second set of issues relates to access. How do you gain access? Getting access to complex situations is, is clearly difficult. Trust me, where you touched on gatekeepers too. The issue of taking sides, um, which can be done overtly or implicitly. Um, often, um, may be perceived to be taking side simply by talking to a given party. Um, the act of building trust with a given uh, group of people may be perceived by others as, as taking their side, um, when from your perspective it may not necessarily mean that, etc. etc. So the access question is a, is a deeply complicated one in, in complex situations, and it's, it's often almost impossible to get equal access to all parties to a conflict. Um, there are communication issues. Um, need to respect dignity, agency, um, collaboration questions, um, a range of different parties you may collaborate with, community read, translator, gatekeepers, um, <coughs> particularly as an outsider in a conflict zone, the issue of collaboration, link to communication are really very, very vital key issues. Um, for one, one of the reasons why collaboration the communication matters around security um, and the range of people in a sense who security is partly your responsibility. Um, you have responsibility for your own security but you also have a responsibility for security to the range of other people who are involved in the research that um, often you would have, have instigated. Um, and Julie Motors has a powerful phrase, the life raft of relative safety for outsiders means that actually in most situations where risk develops, you as an outsider have the capacity to leave. You have the capacity to go back to your home university and hometown. Um, but those people who are most likely to face um, risk and security and danger are those local collaborators. Um, and you have a responsibility to anticipate, um, to anticipate that and reduce the potential for that risk as part of the relation collaborating collaboration relationship. There are compliance issues. Um, by compliance, I mean um, compliance with professional codes, but also basic good practice. Um, the kind of ethical principles that I'm going to come on, um, I'm going to touch on in, in a moment. Um, I guess the most powerful example of this, and, and related to the second point here about spoiling the field, I had was in again the late 19th. Uh, 90s, going to South Africa to work on the Truth Commission, where it had already been South Africa, where it had already been very heavily researched. And one of the first people I spoke to was um, a woman who definitely described herself as a survivor, who testified at the Truth Commission, had been interviewed many times. And almost the first thing she said, she hurled this comment in my face, was that she felt that she had been raped by researchers. And that was her exact words. Um, now, as a researcher, that's a comment that you're going to take with you for the rest of your life, because I think it's part of the way she said it, as well as what she actually said. Um, and what it brought home to me was the, um, I mean, part, partly what had happened to this particular woman, obviously, but also the responsibility you have to, as a researcher, to future researchers. The bad ethical practice doesn't only affect you and those who you are immediately conducting research with. It, affect, it affects anyone else who will follow you who may want to do research in that, in that area. The, the challenge of building trust with this woman was significantly greater than it might otherwise have been because of her experience of really poor, uh, essentially very extractive research practice. People had come, had taken her knowledge and her experience and her incredibly powerful story, had promised her things that had not been delivered and had left, and she never heard them again. And she had simply lost faith in academic researchers as a result. Um, and finally there are accountability issues. Um, 
One of the real problems about academic research is the almost complete absence of accountability. Who are you accountable to when you go and do your field work? Um, if you are accountable, you're more likely to be, in terms of established mechanisms, to be accountable upwards to university ethics committees, to your funders and so on, than you are to be accountable downwards to those with whom you work. Um, part of your responsibility ethically is to try and institute mechanisms that ensure that you are accountable in both directions. Um, I certainly wouldn't argue that upwards accountability is, is irrelevant or not important. I think there are responsibilities to universities and so on, but not to the exclusion of other kinds of accountability. This is very similar to the debates that NGOs have about their accountability, um, upwards versus downwards, and it applies to research too. Um, in terms of the relationship between the individual and the individual researcher and into UE, clearly the, the basic ethical contract is, is the informed consent process. Um, now, I'm not going to go through this in great detail because I'm, I'm assuming most of you will have filled in ethics or will, uh, will understand this. But um, it's really, let me just emphasize a few points. The issue of disclosure is, is complicated and multi layered. Um, and it isn't just about yourself, the project, it explains things like focus risks and potential benefits. Um, voluntariness and autonomy is similarly complicated. Um, the permissions you seek may also need to be broken down. Can you use the person's name is an obvious one? There may be certain details people don't, don't want used. Can you quote someone directly or do they want their information just used in the background? Are they happy to have their interview material used in printed documents but not on online material, etc., etc., etc.? I mean, there are a whole range of different things you may need to think about there. Question of comprehension. Um, I'm ashamed to say that I haven't got a translation on this list, which I should have, it's very obvious. Um, do, people, do people understand what the interview involves and what will follow? Um, one of the things which struck me, has struck me a lot in research and the South African experience around the TRC is a very good example of this, are the number of people who have said, long after being involved in the research process. If I really understood what my story going public had meant, I wouldn't have talked to you, I wouldn't have talked to the Commission. Um, and these people at the time would have said, yes, I'm happy for my story to go public and so on. And, and so sometimes there is a um, there is a requirement to gently interrogate or at least yourself think through um, consent. I, I personally believe there are times when consent can and should be overridden, actually, on the basis of researchers um, feeling substantiated, hopefully through with others, that um, the, all the components of consent are not even often properly understood or, um, or shouldn't have been given for some reason. Um, there are a whole range of phrases linked to research that people may not understand, and on and off the record is, um, is one. Um, and obviously the rise of citizen media, social media, makes um, this kind of question even more pertinent. Um, do people really understand what may happen to their story or interview um, when it can be uploaded onto the media and circulated internationally, often in, in minutes? Um, and then finally, competence, which is normally associated with particular categories, particular groups of people, children, people with disabilities, those who are traumatized. Um, so, I guess the point I would make about this is that, on the one hand, it's a very useful set of reference points, but as it stands there, it assumes we live in a, in a relatively benign world. And those of us who do the research in the kind of places that most of us do, um, do not conduct research in those kinds of environments, <coughs> where people are autonomous, where trust can be developed relatively easily, where power relationships are not that unequal, um, etc., etc. So, the classic informed consent process, very individualistic, is based on a set of assumptions that don't um, necessarily or often apply to the conflict post-conflict research. So what do we do? Um, this slide is based on work of um, Australian scholars 
um, Mackenzie McDowell and Pitawa, who've done work on um, the refugees. Um, and I think that their findings are broadly generalizable to conflict and post conflict settings. Um, so they say, in contrast to this ideal type informed consent um, environment, this is more usually what we confront as conflict researchers. Um, acute vulnerability, people who have experienced various kinds of violence, who may have lost their livelihoods, who may have had families separated, um, etc., etc. Um, people whose autonomy and frankly decision-making capacity has been um, undermined. Um, that may be, for example, because refugees are um, really beholden to humanitarian agencies and or to um, other actors, former, um, former belligerents or even current belligerents um, in conflict who have reformed, regrouped, and gained control over refugee camps. A very famous example of Mitra Hanway and others in Eastern Zaire as it was then um, after the round of genocide, etc. etc. Um, so Autonomy certainly cannot be assumed. The capacity, I guess, this is what I was referring to earlier about potentially overriding consent in certain circumstances. People's capacity to make freely informed choices um, certainly can't be assumed. Um, mistrust, Rachel touched on this. Um, it may be a generalized mistrust, um, it may be distrust that's focused on particular people. Um, as an outsider, sometimes. You may be specifically targeted as someone to, to mistrust. Actually, ironically, in certain ways, sometimes as an outsider, you may be excluded, actually, from a more generalized distrust because you are an outsider. Um, so there aren't general rules for how this applies, but to understand the, the context and the complexity of, of trust is clearly vital. Um, and then finally, I suppose, the, this issue of, of community. Um, which again has been touched on already, but the, the notion of consent is individualistic um, in its classic sense. Um, I'm sure many of us have experiences where actually consent cannot conceivably be negotiated on that basis. It has to be negotiated through collectives, communities, families. Um, and, and so actually the consent is being negotiated with, with groups of, of various sorts in order to gain access. Um, and sometimes that's an uncomfortable arrangement. You may want to talk about women's rights and have to go through male leaders, male religious groups in order to get access to women in a given community. Um, community representation is often extremely complicated and contested. Who do you go to? Um, what does it mean if a certain group in the community is happy to allow you access and one who isn't? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I guess what it means is that the consent process is not just a collective one, but it is a more public one often. Um, and that has implications for what you can offer in terms of anonymity and confidentiality. Um, if I had a pound for every hour I'd spent an ethics committee discussing what the difference between these two terms was or whether they were the same, I would be a very rich man. Um, I suppose my understanding of research in these kinds of environments is that often if you have negotiated access through um, community leaders um, in what is often public process, probably the best that you can offer um, is anonymity in research outputs. You cannot offer confidentiality. Uh, the identity of the community will be very widely known within the communities in which you work. Um, so, actually, what you can offer um, in, in relation to anonymity and confidentiality is really quite, is really quite limited. So, that's the problem. What have Mackenzie et al. Um, suggested as a solution? Their solution is twofold. One is that consent needs to be iterative, which essentially means it's a process that there's a requirement to develop a shared understanding of what the research is about and the research can become a partnership through which to build trust. And the second issue relates to autonomy 
an understanding that autonomy is not something that individuals have to develop individually, but is held in this, and very specifically developed through relationships. Um, so people do, can develop capacities and competences, competences that inform their autonomy through relationships, and that the research relationship is one such relationship through which people can build their capacities and autonomy. Um, so, really what this is arguing is that research is a process, um, and that it's about building relationships, and that through process and, and relationship building, you can develop trust, potentially develop, develop capacity, and so on. Um, I think this is powerful, and certainly being through the abstracts, it seems to resonate with some of the approaches that a number of the rest of the world were advocating. My only caveat about this is that the danger is that it builds up another ideal type around informed consent. If you're working with refugees, with the fluid population, is it actually going to be possible to maintain contact with people over a long period of time? Are the more participatory anthropological methodologies that this seemingly implies going to be possible? And, and in conflict situations, they aren't always. Um, and so as, a, as another ideal type reference point, I think it's, it's helpful and it's better and more appropriate than the classic informed consent process, but it still has its limitations. Um, and there are organizations um, that I'm familiar with, Amnesty International in particular, who have developed um, other ways of looking at, at consent in these kinds of, of situations, which are, are much more rough and ready. Um, so, for example, Amnesty, if it's working um, on the case of someone who's been forced to disappear or is in community guarded in detention, it will sometimes work on the basis of implied consent. Why would this person conceivably not want us to do research on their case? And work on their behalf? Is that presumptuous? I don't know. But what else can you do in a situation like that where it's actually impossible to contact the person and generate that consent? Um, in this centre, family members is another way, obviously, um, to work. So, I suppose the point I would want to make here is, is it's not going to solve the problem to come up with another ideal type or be one more suited to the situation. What you need is a range of different tools and potential responses that can respond to messy, transient, conflict situations, and some of which are far from perfect ethically, frankly but maybe necessary to get any research done and potentially to help anybody. Um, so, some other values I want to touch on briefly that are related to relationships. The first is one that many of you will be familiar with, although I'm perhaps not framed in this way. The tension between validating the victim and validating the story. Um, this is a, something that came out of our work on responsibility to the story. I mean, you can display the story with the truth um, if you're not sufficiently informed by the person that isn't just going to be the truth. Um, <laughs> the former requires empathy, acknowledgement, and belief, actually, ultimately, um, at least in the immediate contact of the interview situation. The latter, questioning, skepticism, even disbelief. Um, you can't train someone for how to balance that tension in a given interview. You can alert someone that this tension is likely to arise. Um, my hope is that most people, where there is a tension, would fall down on the side of the former rather than the latter. Um, but there may be very difficult situations where you feel it's, it's utterly imperative to get a story, the story, the truth. Um, that requires pushing someone you're into the who's clearly suffered um, great violence. I mean, I would hope to be very, very unusual um, circumstances, but um, that, you will, that you will experience that tension in conflict interviews is, is certain. Many of you will, will certainly uh, be familiar with it. Next issue is the degree of control, um, or the balance of control in the interview context. In many situations, really beyond the interview, for reasons I've already described, there may be virtually no control, actually, that can be 
I've given a promise to the one to do. But if you can follow the iterative consent uh, relational autonomy um, model, then all kinds of control can potentially um, be offered and given to the interview. Can they comment on an interview transcript? Will you share your initial analysis of the data? Will you discuss the findings of your research with them? And that is a continuum that moves the person uh, who is the interviewee from a source to an, an, an analyst, actually, and, and does speak to building capacities, relational autonomy, etc., etc. An interviewee who is involved in a research process that goes through to discussing the findings can potentially learn an enormous amount about uh, analytical skills, research, um, dissemination of information, um, etc., etc. The next point relates to benefits. Um, I guess the my experience anyway is that in the first instance, many of the people who have suffered violence and human rights abuses are understandably most interested in remedies and solutions for their particular case, their fate. Um, um, it's quite unusual for researchers actually to seek to intervene um, certainly only at that level. More usually researchers are looking to influence public awareness, international knowledge about something, policy on something or whatever, instead of, or certainly in addition to, the individual uh, remedy that may be required in the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and that's also something that's difficult to negotiate often. Um, can you tell, do you tell someone actually the benefits of this research are not likely to change your circumstances very much? They may change national policy on violence against women, which may very indirectly, let's hope, influence your particular situation, but we're not going to solve the particular instance of gender-based violence that, um, that you yourself suffered. Um, it can be this through the informed consent process, but it's certainly not an easy conversation to be had. Um, both of these things relate uh, to the broader question of how you manage expectations. Um, the, the, the tendency in informed consent processes is not really what the point, I suppose, of this side is to say the temptation as well as the tendency to inform consent, is to shy away from these kind of difficult questions. And actually, it's ethical to engage with them, because at the end of the day, um, the real outcome of, of the interview for yourself and for those who are interviewing actually engages around. It's a very difficult question like this. Is it going to benefit me? Well, in many cases, probably not, actually. Um, and so on. Um, Okay, so that's... How long have I had? About half an hour. Okay. Um, I'll start speaking more quickly. Um, can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got another ten minutes, have I? Yeah, okay. Um, that sort of ends the, the relationship side of it. I'm going to come on to talk about context. And I will, need, I will be more brief. Um, it's not particularly new or innovative, in fact it's not at all new or innovative to argue that. Conflict is complicated, there are many layers of violence involved in conflict, and that it doesn't end, violence doesn't end with peace processes, political transitions, that often it is, violence is re-described, really reconfigured. The past returns to inform the present, often in unexpected ways, but often in very violent ways. Um, but this question of layered violence and continued violence is not often thought about in methodological or ethical, um, ethical terms. Um, my own, you know, obviously, there's a, a huge literature on different forms of violence, structural every day, etc., etc., which I don't have the time to go into, but my own personal experience of this in South Africa was really around the poorest boundary between political and criminal violence. Um, which was there previous to 1994, the first democratic elections, and has continued really ever since. 
actors moving across this boundary between criminal and political violence, often many times, in different directions. And so trying to categorize violence becomes very difficult. The distinction I've got here between what you might call social function of resistance and antisocial banditry, it's often very hard, actually, to decide where to place certain forms of, of violence. Hopefully, in South Africa in the early 90s, they had a phrase for it. People were called comrades. Comrade, com is short for comrade. Clear political connotations, political affiliation with the NC. But Sotsi is a gangster. And so they invented this term that perfectly captures this person, these, these, these groups of people who are shifting across the line between crime and politics. Um, the impacts of this in post-conflict settings uh, in particular, which is what I want to focus on, can be very significant. Discursively, crime and violence can be a way of re-articulating social divisions and otherness. What I mean by that is um, it becomes a way of saying what is otherwise unsayable. In South Africa, people don't talk in public very much in a very racist term. But they do talk very explicitly about us and them in terms of crime, um, which is now pitting a white population and a, a new black middle class against the still impoverished majority. Enduring crime and violence has material consequences of various kinds. In South Africa, it's redrawn the physical landscape in very dramatic terms. Um, South Africa is no longer uh, segregated racially, um, in terms of residential where you can live, people in theory can live, can live anywhere, but um, violence has reshaped, violence and economics have reshaped the landscape. So you have gated communities, um, you have first world glamour and affluence, cheap by jowl with third world poverty and despondency. Um, and I guess underwriting this is a very damaging political message, um, which then codes calls a code, a code, violence becomes a code for political unease. Um, you have, and there are many, many countries where this is the case, you have a kind of intersection, perfect storm of crime, violence, inequality, and segregation, which undermines the democratic project, and people's faith in the democratic project, produces a backlash against things like human rights protections often even creates a nostalgia for the past. Um, so that's the problem. Um, the solution is, <coughs> needless to say, not an easy one. Um, and I suppose it refers back to this idea of kind of disciplinary blinkers. Um, and I'll, again, I'll use human rights as an example. The problem with human rights in this situation is it focuses on political violence in the state at a time when violence is often being decentralized and privatized. So it misses often the worst forms of violence. It also often prioritizes court proceedings and due process, which at this moment is often affecting perpetrators. So it can seem to be defending perpetrator rights rather than victim rights. Um, so in a whole range of different ways, human rights can miss the point, can seem to be on the wrong side, certainly isn't capturing the full reality of what the world's happening. Um, in terms of responses, I think there's clearly a, a need for diverse sources and interdisciplinary research. And by interdisciplinary research, I don't mean simply combining, I understand multidisciplinary research to be you combine a bit of ethnography and a bit of political science. Interdisciplinary research for me is, is research that challenges the boundaries of existing disciplines and fields and develop something new, which I think is probably what's required here. Um, the absolute best source that I found in South Africa to, to describe this really, the kind of poorest boundary between criminal violence and political violence is crime fiction. I don't know if anyone knows Dion Mayer, these kinds of authors have brilliantly plotted both on the side of the apartheid state and on the side of the ANC, the liberation movement, how people move between crime and politics and have continually done so. Um, there is no other, no other academic or other creative source that has done it as well as crime fiction. It's not the first place perhaps we can go, but 
Um, it's, a, it's an interesting insight into the you know, kind of creativity that we need to employ um, in terms of sources. Um, one of the problems with social sciences generally and specifically in this area is we can end up saying two things. One is it's all very complicated, which is true to an extent but not terribly helpful. Um, and the other, if you, as the first step beyond that, is to call for holistic solutions and, and, and all understandings, which is also true but only the second of a hundred steps that you need to make. Um, yes, to address the compli complicated violence, for example, in South Africa, you need to address, you need to understand economics, history, politics, a whole range of things. But if we do believe on that continuum from do no harm to take some action, that there is a responsibility to act, you can't leave things with it's very complicated and we need some kind of holistic response. Um, researchers need to think strategically about intervention. So, how do you prioritize? Once you've made a shopping list of things that need to be done, how do you prioritize? What is the kind of sequencing that might be needed to achieve change? Um, so, for example, is there evidence to support the fact that crime can be very significantly reduced in poor communities simply by providing street lights? This is something you can research uh, and see if there's an evidence based for. You can also research local perceptions about what the priorities should be. Um, and this needs to go beyond the wish list to be saying, you know, if there's one thing that you can run through to address this problem, what might it be? Um, and the final point is that this evolving, shifting violence often involves rethinking things like objectivity and solidarity. Um, actors in violence in this kind of situation all tend to end up with shades of grey. You, you don't end up with heroes and villains, or you end up with just villains. Um, and in terms of change, where you seek to align yourself, where your solidarities are, you see the drivers of change, may need to change. Many South African researchers have gone through a deeply difficult transition from I mean, essentially being aligned with the ANC and its agenda for change, to now needing someone else to go. Um, and part of that process is you know, to ongoing violence, there are other causes as well, obviously, but um, where they've chosen to go varies from, you know, trying to form a viable political opposition party <coughs> to backing social movements or whatever, but um, it's a, this is a difficult journey, I suppose, what I'm trying to say sometimes for researchers to challenging your assumptions, your own histories and affiliations. Um, I don't have any more time left, do I? <laughs> Um, the last set of issues then just around control. Um, I mean, I think we've covered the, this, this issue about the way in which social media, citizenship media, in a way is, is democratizing research in a way which is really exciting and empowering. Um, but also, I don't know that we fully understand um, in a whole range of ways. But it does make a lot of effort. Um, challenges. The material circulates very quickly and very far from the original site of the demonstration, the interview, whatever it might be. Um, invariably, there's no consent. People filming on phones, demonstrators um, in Cairo or whatever, and sticking those images on, on, um, online will almost never have got consent for that. Um, and we've kind of the kind of dark side of this, the places from Burma to Iran, this kind of material has been used by the state to oppress um, opposition. Um, some ways of responding. There are some common work sense ways of responding. A lot of this is informed by the work of an organization called Witness. Um, they sometimes use the reasonable, reasonable person guide, or they revisit some of the, and revisit and rethink um, some of the the basic informed consent principle is comprehension, voluntariness. So, for example, they get people to, in a sense, the test is the worst case scenario test. They get people to think of what is the worst thing that could actually happen. Who are the people you most don't want to get this information? Assume they will get it. And then decide what you want to say and whether you want to take part. And that may end up somewhat narrowing down the scope of research. 
but does seem to me to be, um, to the extent that people understand the context that we're talking about, an ethically responsible thing. There are also technological advantages. A number of organizations that have platforms that people can upload to have prompts now where they will say, have you thought about informed consent before uploading this? Um, and um, things like devices that you can now have on mobile phones that can see identity through blurring and so on. So, but my feeling is that the, the ethics technology is always playing catch up with the dissemination technology, and it's never quite there. Um, so there is always this gap, which for ease, if you like. Um, well, foolishly, again, I, I promised to suggest an enabling ethics. Um, the first point is 